Welcome to the summer series at Regency. If you're new to Regency, or maybe this is the first time you've checked us out, you might be wondering, what is a summer series? Well, each summer we bring in different speakers to share with us a message from God's Word. So if you're watching this video on YouTube, we would love for you to click that subscribe button just so you can be notified of new content. If you're watching this through Facebook, would you take a minute and just click the like button and maybe even click the share button to invite someone else to watch with you? So our first speaker for the 2020 Summer Series is a dear friend of mine, Jason Smith. Jason is the one-to-one -one minister for the Isaiah City Church of Christ in Sims. He also serves as the Director of Operations at Mobile Christian School, where he is also one of the assistant baseball coaches. He's a great man of God, uh, a man who loves his family dearly. He and his wife, Heather, have five children. Uh, they're also recently become grandparents, and we are just excited for the message that Jason is going to share with us. So I want to pray for each of us as we prepare to hear a message from God's Word, and then you'll hear from Jason. Let's bow together. God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your Word. Father, thank you for this online platform that we can share together, that we can gather together, even from our own homes. Father, I thank you for the message that Jason is going to present to us. Father, open our hearts and may his word, may your words come into our hearts and change our lives. We love you and we love your son Jesus. It's through his name that we pray. Amen. Jesus says in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, A new command I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. There are several things, several times in the New Testament, if we really do a deep search, that we can almost in every book of the New Testament find the commands given to love our neighbor, love one another, let brotherly love continue almost through every book in the New Testament. And I want to talk about that for a little while. I want to talk about that because if we're going to be more like Jesus, shouldn't we follow His commandments? If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Let's step back just for a second, though. Sometimes we can be guilty of taking a legalistic approach to the Scriptures, and we sometimes neglect the spiritual side or the more emotional side of salvation. So let me ask you this question. Why should I bother to do good works if salvation doesn't require it? If I fulfill the commands in the New Testament to become a Christian and we see that good works is not one of those things that earns our salvation, why then should I bother to do that? Well, from a legalistic standpoint, I guess that can be a good question. But let's look at it from another angle. Why should I do good works for my wife if my marriage is not based on the works that I do for her? If I have no fear of getting divorced, why bother doing nice things for my wife? I do those good works for her. I do those nice things for her because I love her, not to earn her love, not to buy her love, not to get married, not to stay married, but because I want to. I want to please her because I love her. I have yet to sit down and make the calculation, how little can I do for my wife and still stay married? My goal is not to avoid divorce. My goal is to make the most of the relationship with my wife. In a similar manner, I'm saved if I've complied with the conditions laid out in the New Testament. And I love Jesus because of what he did for me. Because of this, I should never have to ask that question, how little can I do and still get to heaven? Rather, the question I should ask is, how best can I show my love and develop the relationship with Jesus to its fullest potential? You see, salvation does require that we love Jesus. How do I know this? Well, because Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. But how do you understand that verse? How do you understand what it means? Does it mean to you, A, I can prove my love for Jesus by keeping His commandments, or B, 
if I am head over heels in love with Jesus, then naturally I will keep His commandments. See, the first mindset is trying to perform those acts of service, those acts of obedience, in order to earn God's pleasure. But the second mindset is performing those acts of service out of gratitude for what Jesus did for me, knowing that I already have God's pleasure. All God does for us is a gift, but it is a gift motivated by His love for us. Romans 6, 23 says that the gift of salvation is free. All men have sinned, but the free gift of salvation comes from God. And what does God want from us? He wants our love. In either case, in either mindset, we have to look at the state of our heart. What is my motivation? If we look in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, we see that Jesus highlights the Ephesian church. And originally, Jesus says, I love what you were doing because you were performing your, your works because they were head over heels in love with Jesus. They were doing those things to bring Him pleasure because of the gratitude that they have for what Jesus did for them. But then somewhere, sometime along the way, in the course of their daily life, they forgot that first love. And Jesus tells them that they need to remember their first love and start doing those good works again, not to earn my, your salvation, not to earn my pleasure, but because of the gratitude that we have for what Jesus did for us. So here's a test for you while you are performing good works, while you are uh, engaged in acts of service. How do you feel? If you really examine your emotions, if you really examine your attitude, your motivation, does doing these good deeds, does performing these acts of service, does it bring me joy? Does it bring a smile to my face? Does it give me a warm heart? Do I look for opportunities to help in any area that I can be involved in? Or do I perform these deeds just out of obligation? See, I'm a Christian and I'm expected to perform these things and so that's just what I have to do. Do I show up and then try to drift away and hide in the background? Do I help others with a smile on my face, but all the while in my head complain about all the other things that I could be doing, all the other places that I could be? What is my motivation? You see, love that is motivated by a command is a very shallow love. Imagine, again, loving my wife only because I can't get married unless I love her. Well, see, that would be a very selfish, a very self-seeking love, only loving her to get something for me. But the love that result, results in our salvation, the love that results that comes from being obedient to Christ is a love that prompts our obedience to Jesus' teaching. Love comes first, then our obedience. Love isn't a product of of obedience to a command. It's not a chore that has to be done or some sort of punishment is going to come our way, but rather love is the joy of sharing God's life and blessings with His people and those around us. Now for you English majors out there who know a lot more about English than I do, grammatically speaking, in John 13, 34, love one another is a command. However, we are told to love as Jesus loved us. Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you to love one another just as I have loved you. Jesus gives us His love as a free gift. My love then becomes a pitiful love if I love only because I'm commanded to do it. When we are fulfilling love because it is a command, then the willingness to do those things is often not there. Rather, to love Jesus, to love as Jesus loves, I have to love because I want to, not because I'm afraid I'm going to go to hell if I don't. Therefore, Jesus has given us a command that we can only fulfill if we aren't motivated by the command. Now, I know that's a mouthful, so I want to say it again. 
Jesus has given us a command that we can only fulfill if we aren't motivated by the command. Love is not a work. It's not something that you do, but it's something that prompts you to do. It's something that prompts you to action. It's what motivates us to be obedient to Jesus' words. Back to our text in John chapter 13. After Jesus washes the disciples' feet in that terrific act of service, Jesus states the theme of the next few chapters of John, which is love one another. He states this as a new command, but the command was given in Leviticus chapter 19. What's new about the command, though, is the measure of love Jesus adds to it, as I have loved you. He goes on to say that the true mark of His disciple, of His church, will be the love that we have for each other. Not how we get everything right. Not how we obey the commands completely down to the T. But it's our love. How many times did Jesus rebuke the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes for getting every little jot and tittle exactly right, crossing every T and dotting every I. How many times did he rebuke them, though, because of the attitude that they had? In John 14, 15, Jesus says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. In John 14, 21, he says, Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. In Verses 23 and 24, he continues on saying, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Three separate times, Jesus tells his disciples, If they love him, they will keep his commandments. Now in chapter 15, he continues as saying that if you remain in my love, you must obey my commands. In verses 9 through 14, Jesus says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. He drives the point home in verse 17, where he says, These things I command you, so that you will love one another. Jesus repeatedly told His disciples to obey His commandments and His teachings. Yet the only specific command that He has given in this case is that they love each other. They love one another. In chapter 17, the prayer that Jesus, is, that Jesus says that, he is, that is heard by His disciples, He desires that the world would believe in Him because of the unity of the disciples. The commands to love and to be united cannot be separated. How can we love one another and be divided? Think about what's going on in our country right now. Think about all of the, the riots and, and the hate that is going on throughout this nation with the protest and, and just, just everything that's going on. What if we stopped and started acting more like Jesus? What if we fulfilled these commands that Jesus has given us and loved one another like we love ourselves. Not only does it take place out in the world, but how many times in our own churches have we not fulfilled these commands? How many times have we set down the pew from someone or set across the auditorium from, from someone that we just find a hard time loving that person? How can we call ourselves Christians and not fulfill these commands that Jesus has given us? John goes on to say in 1 John chapter 3, he's, he's echoing the things that Jesus taught. He states that those who are true Christians will be known by our love for one another. In verses 21 and 23 of John, 1 John chapter 3, John says, Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from Him anything we ask because we obey His commands and do what pleases Him. And this is His command, to believe in the name of Jesus Christ and to love one another as He has commanded us. The only commands that are given here, believe and love one another. 
faith, and love. Jesus' words. Paul also gets on, in on the action as well. In Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 10, Owe no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For all of the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. Any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Galatians 5.14, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The purpose of preachers and teachers and the elders is to equip the saints for service. We are to serve one another in love. Love should motivate our servant heart. In Ephesians 2.10, we see that we are God's workmanship created in Christ to do good works. Service is an essential part, a defining aspect of the Christian life. Pure and undefiled religion, according to James 1.27, is to visit the orphans and the widows. Jesus Himself even said in Matthew 25 that He will separate the saved from the lost based on who fed the hungry, who gave drink to the thirsty, who visited those in prison and clothed the naked. <clears throat> Love should motivate this servant, servant heart. When we become Christians... We have the gift of the Holy Spirit given to us. This should help us learn how to establish and maintain those loving relationships. However, I think sometimes we look at this as just for those who are mature Christians, sort of a, a graduate level Christianity, if you will. But really, this is basic Christianity. This is beginning Christianity. Jesus told us that the two greatest commandments or to love God and love others. The first fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5.22 is love. Personally, I think all of the other fruits that follow after love flow out of our love. Think of it this way. This, this is an example that, that I often use to, to help me understand this. If I walk up to an apple tree and I pick an apple, think of that apple as love. But what else can I get from the apple? I can get apple juice. I can get apple cider. I can get apple pie. I can get apple dumplings. Uh, I can get apple jelly, apple jam. All of those things that come from the apple are all of those other fruits of the Spirit that come out of the love that we have. So in order to apply this better, in order for me to become a better Christian, in order for me to think, act, and be more like Jesus Christ, I need to work on three things. One thing I need to work on is how I think about others. Instead of always thinking, how will this affect me? How will this affect my feelings, my rights, my needs? I need to put others' th thoughts and feelings ahead of mine. How can, how can I show this difficult person that I come in contact with, this difficult family member that I'm around a lot, how can I show that person the love of Christ? How can I serve that person? What kind of capacity can I do those things in? Instead of thinking angry thoughts, instead of wishing ill will on someone, or how this person has wronged me and I want to get revenge on them, or how they've mistreated me, think how Jesus would treat that person. How would Jesus act if he was in my situation? I think back to uh, Jesus when he was confronted by the Pharisees with the woman caught in adultery. And the Pharisees, knowing that Jesus was a Jew and knowing that Jesus would have known the law perfectly, they confront him with this woman and say, she was caught in the very act of adultery. And Jesus, you know the law says we should stone this person, but what do you say? How wise Jesus was, how merciful Jesus was, how much we can take from that story. But how often do we act in the same way the Pharisees do? How often do we look at those people who have wronged us and just want revenge or those people that we know aren't living their life the way they should and we want to denounce them to hell, just like the Pharisees did? But what did Jesus do? Jesus bent down first and He started writing something in the dirt. When He stood up, 
What wise words he said. Those of you who were without sin, throw the first stone. And then he just simply bent back down and started writing in the dirt again. And the older men, they got it. They understood what Jesus was saying. They got it first. They started walking away all the way down to the younger men until no one's left. And Jesus then looks at that, at that woman and says, where, where are the people who accused you? Where are your accusers who, who have all of this against you? If there's no one to accuse you, I don't accuse you either, but go on your way and don't sin anymore. What if we had that kind of mercy? What if we thought that way about others? The second thing that we need to work on is how we speak to others. I need to stop saying things that tear other people down. I need to think about saying things that build other people up. I need to stop lying and stretching the truth and exaggerating things to make me look good or to gain an advantage in some sort of area of my life. I need to stop gossiping and slandering other people. I really need to watch what I say and start really thinking about how this is going to affect other people. Again, if we're thinking about loving others as I love myself. I don't like people talking about me. I don't like, like people saying slanderous things or gossiping about me. So then why am I going to do that in my own right? The last thing I need to think about, the last thing I need to change, the last thing I need to work on is I need to change my behavior. I need to start practicing loving deeds. I need to check my motivation about why I want to do these good works, why I want to have that servant heart. I need to look for opportunities to serve. And the best place, in my opinion, and, and one of the areas that I really need to work on as well, is I need to start in my home with my own family. Sometimes that can be the hardest place to really show the love of others because we're around these people so much. They know our ins and outs. We, they know what makes us tick. And sometimes that can be the hardest place to, to show that love that Christ showed to us. I know this seems basic, and that's because it is. Sometimes, though, we struggle really bad in these areas. Sometimes we may excel at them. We may be really good at them for a short time, but then we revert back to our old ways of doing things. Growing in love for others is a lifelong process. Becoming a Christian and growing as a Christian is a change from being in the darkness to being in the light. The darkness doesn't disappear instantly. But gradually over time, as the true light shines more and more in our hearts, we become more and more like Christ. We will never arrive at a place where we can say, I love everyone perfectly, what next? We have to continue striving to be more like Christ each and every day. Love, meaning an active, serving, sacrificial love, is not a command, it is the command. Except it's not a command at all. Because you can't command love, or it's not really love. It is what we have to become. As God is love, we must be love. I'm going to say that again. Love is not a command, it is the command. Except it's not a command at all because you can't command love or it's not really love. It is what we have to become. As God is love, we must be love. Thank you for listening.